Hi, everyone. Welcome, Cashflow Portal followers. We have Ryan with us today. We get to pick his brains on his syndication journey. Um, as you know, I'm Christina. I have the honor of interviewing lots and lots of syndicators. I'm also a syndication enthusiast, so I wanted to turn it over to Ryan to give our audience an introduction. Hi, Christina. Hi, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. I'm honored to be on and uh, yeah, looking forward to chatting. Awesome. So I guess first question. Um, I saw that you graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in television, radio, and here you are making, uh, I guess, a podcast feature. Um, and then you landed in real estate. So take us a little back in terms of, you know, how did you get started in real estate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so the interesting thing is uh, I, I should have probably been in some kind of a business or real estate career from the beginning. Um, but, you know, when you're a kid, there's a lot of uh propaganda out there to say follow your dreams do something creative art is kind of the spirit of the soul and i was good at making videos and so i just kept making them and making them and you know at one point you're kind of young you got to figure things out so i said well let me give this a try so that's what i got my degree in and you know it was very different working uh full-time as a career doing that than it was just making fun videos with your friends on the side so uh after a few years of doing that and you know reading all of the books like rich dad poor dad and you know talking to other friends who were working in business or real estate careers i realized that that's really where i should have been this whole time and uh it was a tough decision to leave all that behind and go into real estate but i'm so glad that i did so here i am now wow well, well um so after you made the initial pivot from you know radio making videos to going to real estate i know you started off in a residential mortgage uh, space, right? And then you built out your rental portfolio and then you moved on into syndications. So mm -hmm. tell me how that small transition uh, came through from mortgage broker to bringing, um, I guess, building out your rental portfolio and then finally doing commercial large scale syndications. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was a bit of a transition. So it was a lot of like luck, faith, and then just kind of belief in myself that I'm just going to figure it out so uh, i i used to live in los angeles doing the video career and after long enough i saved up about ten thousand dollars and that was enough for me to say you know i'm going to leave this industry and i'm just going to trust that i can find my way in real estate so i left california and i moved to austin texas where i still am now and i spent probably about two months just talking to anybody that i could that would listen to me that did real estate and asking them questions picking their brain um, and offering to work as a free intern for them or ask if, you know, anyone was hiring. And, you know, of course, most people weren't, but, you know, they were always nice enough to point me into the next direction. So, um, you know, got lucky enough that a bank hired me as a loan officer trainee. Uh, and I just kind of showed them, hey, I have the hustle and, you know, ready to learn and eager to kind of help be a part of it. Um, one of the senior loan officers saw that enthusiasm, took me under his wing and trained me. Um, and I spent a good, you know, six or sorry, four years with him, seven years in mortgage total, just kind of learning everything I could and growing. Um, luckily, the mortgage lender that uh, the loan officer that took me under his wing also had a lot of rental properties. And you can tell that I was interested in that, too. So we had a lot of conversations, you know, outside of business hours about how the investing side of real estate works. And I let him know that's where I always wanted to be anyway. So. He uh, helped guide me and held my hand as we bought my first duplex and then my first house and then a flip and then, you know, went from there. And, you know, I, I just kind of got the bug and, and knew that the investing side is always where I wanted to be. So eventually, you know, started getting into bigger properties from there. I, in many podcasts, they always, um, the best advice I've heard over and over again is finding a mentor. And that's something that I see like you've done. Definitely, you know, found a mentor. He took you. Uh, under his wings and then kind of, you know, flew from there. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about syndications. I learned about syndications only fairly recently for like four or five months ago. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm always curious to learn, like, how do people even learn about syndications? <laughs> you know, it's funny, like I, from the start, I always just knew I wanted to do big real estate deals. And I thought the only way to do it was to make a bunch of money and then buy a bunch of property and then just get rich and then keep growing from there um but kind of just getting lucky out of your own money so the way that i found out about syndication is a friend of mine um that was a realtor we had done some deals together just as like flips and he had called me and said hey i'm interested in buying a commercial property what do you think and i said i'd love to figure it out and learn where do we start 
And the funny thing is he never really pursued it, but I, I said, this is where I want to eventually be. So I might as well learn it right now. So it was a lot of Google searching, a lot of playing around on YouTube. Um, and there was not a lot of good information kind of right off the bat. It took about three months of digging. And I stumbled across uh, Michael Blanc on YouTube. He's got a podcast and a YouTube series where he talks about syndication. He had a lot of good information out there. Uh, I ended up, he had like a $500 weekend webinar. And of course this was during COVID. So like we couldn't go in person to the mastermind, but I just attended virtually. And then from there, I introduced me to more people. And from there I found out about um, Dave Tupin has real estate lab. I found his Instagram on there. And so he actually um, invited me to join his full mastermind. So I joined him. He was a great mentor and, and taught me a lot about underwriting. And then, you know, as these things go, you just kind of keep the more people you need, the more introductions you can ask for and the bigger your community grows. Uh, eventually I was introduced to Mike Taravella, Jake and Gino. He invited mm -hmm. me to join that community. So now I'm part of, part of that community too. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, I, I just think that with each one that I've joined, I've learned and grown so much. And I found the next level of mentor that has carried me further than I ever could have done on my own. You mentioned that when your friend asked you about, you know, larger scale um, commercial real estate, you're like, sure, you know, I want to learn. I think something I wanted to highlight is more of your mindset. It seems like you had a learner's mindset and you were very willing to learn and figure it out. Can you talk about that shift? Whereas for me, I think I would have been like, uh, I'm not sure what to do or be a little hesitant in taking that leap. But I see that you were brave enough to kind of figure it out and also be brave to take on a new challenge. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a couple of mindsets. There's an entrepreneur mindset that just jumps into something and does it. Uh, and I think that's, you know, got a lot of risk to it. So I would rather figure out all the details, but also kind of know that part of figuring out the details is taking action and learning. But I'd rather feel like I've got as much information as I possibly can and kind of know what to expect, but then jump in and figure out the details along the way. Um, but but kind of to answer your real question, which was, you know, how do you have a learner's mindset? You know, in my head, I, I don't know. I've been a little lucky and fortunate in the sense that things for the most part have gone my way. So I have a little bit of a euphoria in that whatever I choose to do somehow will eventually happen. Um, so I, I don't have that limiting belief of feeling like I can't do anything, but yet at the same time, you know, while right now I feel like I could buy, you know, 50 units or hundred units, something like a 500 unit complex scares me. And I thought oh, that's, that's a little too much, but, you know, so I'll grow into it, but, but I feel like I'll eventually get there. So the way that I kind of think about it is somebody has done whatever it is that I'm trying to do. They've already done that. So it is possible. Maybe they have some genius quality that I don't have, but you know, until I actually meet that person and ask the right questions and find them out and try to learn, I won't know if it's me or something else that's holding me back. So it's incumbent on me to find out what are other people doing that I'm not doing yet? How can I just replicate that and maybe put my own spin on it? And you know, the way to do that is just meet a bunch of people, ask a bunch of questions and try to help someone out and work for free and hope that they kind of take you on. I went to a conference and one of the things I took away was don't reinvent the wheel, right? Like exactly what you said, someone has done in the past, like figure out what they're doing correctly and then kind of implement it into how you want to do it and then go from there. So it, it's, it, I was, it's, it's very um, rudimentary, like duh, right? And then when I heard in the conference, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Like, why am I trying to do all these X, Y, and Z when there's a proven way already? Let me just follow or study that method and then use, I guess, tailor it to my com level of comfort and then go from there. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. When you joined um, some of the masterminds, I guess they always talk about your why. So what is it? What is that motivation, that why piece that keeps you going and motivated to close more deals? Yeah. So, you know, it all started when I was real young and I would just. You're still young. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I was younger than I am now. Yeah. Um, and it started with the just the frustration of the repetition of what life kind of requires. You know, you like, you wake up, you gotta do your chores, you have to go to school, you have to come home and do your homework, you have to go to work, you have to have your schedule set by someone else. And like, there's so much out there in the world that we could do, but yet we're kind of like stuck in this rhythm and routine. And everyone's always chasing happiness that is kind of just around the corner. And even once you get there, there's some other 
you know, process that you got to like work through until what you're retired and you're 65 and then you're too old to have fun and enjoy life. Right. Um, and so my why and my mindset has always just been around, let's, let's do what we need to do to get the freedom to just be happy and be the best person that we can be and help others kind of get there as well. Um, and I found like the easiest way to do that is, Hey, if you have enough money, um, and you have the kind of work where you're free, uh, you're free to make your own choices with your time, where you spend it, who you spend it with and what you spend it doing. Um, that's kind of what's most important in life for me. So kind of, if, if I have to work really hard now, with the goals, I think this will better way to live life than just to you know, live for the weekend and then kind of suffer up until then. And even on the weekend, you're still driving Monday. So I'd, I'd, I'd much rather take uh, advantage of working hard so that you can have a freedom lifestyle. So, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I have to be the biggest or the richest or anything, but as long as I've got enough to not have to worry about it and, you know, help other people, that's enough for me. I have a very similar mindset in terms of working hard, working harder when you're younger. That way you can kind of enjoy your freedom and your time later mm -hmm. on in life. Um, mm -hmm. That's definitely feasible. I, I was like, oh, you know, yeah, I totally agree with living for the weekend, like not weekends are too short. Right. And like you mm -hmm. want to have more ownership, more freedom and everything you've said, more financial freedom. And I, I think the audience can all agree. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. I'm very interested to learn more about your first deal. So <laughs> I know you closed a few deals. Um, I'm always interested to learn like the I guess the what was it, 16 unit. I believe, or um, can you talk about that deal, how you found it, what was your role, kind of give us some, uh, the framework of it. Sure, sure. So the first, you know, duplex that I ever bought, I was real nervous. I think I only had maybe $18,000 to my name at that point, and eight of them were needed for the down payments, and the rest, I was just hoping I didn't have any big expenses, but I was making good money, so I didn't, even if it was a problem, I wasn't worried about it. But doing that first duplex, dealing with tenants gave me the confidence to do the next one. And the other thing is working as a mortgage lender, I was dealing with a lot of people applying for loans the whole time, which are very similar to tenants. You have to check their credit history. You have to work with them. You have to talk about money and rules and what's allowed and not allowed. So there's a whole lot of uh, synergy between being a mortgage lender and managing properties with tenants. And I found that that has really been a, a benefit in, in crossing that over. So the, the first few properties really gave me the confidence to go to the next one, to go to the next one, to do a little bit bigger. And the one that we just closed, honestly, you know, uh, on Monday this week, it's Wednesday now, um, you know, is a 32 unit property. Um, I did it with two other general partners and then we had a silent investor. Uh, so there's only four of us that are doing the deal. Um, and honestly, I think if it had been me alone, I still probably would have done it, but I would have been pretty scared and nervous. Uh, having these two other people by my side as mentors and partners makes it a lot more easy to have the confidence to go in there and say, Hey, whatever happens, we're going to figure it out. Um, but yeah, just to kind of talk about that deal. I mean, you know, I, I, I quit my job as a loan officer about a year ago to go full time into this and I had quite a bit of savings and I just, I knew that I would take a hit financially, but I just knew that eventually long-term, this is the career and lifestyle that I want. So why delay it any longer? Why not just get started doing what I know I eventually need to be doing? Um, but it took a year of, you know, networking, talking to brokers, calling owners directly, sending out mailers, just trying stuff that didn't work. Um, I sent out a lot of offers. I, you know, went on a lot of tours. I got close a lot of times and they, they kept falling through. And, you know, I got a little discouraged so many times, but, it, you know, I kind of go to bed and I wake up the next morning and say, you know, this is kind of what it takes. It will eventually work out. Just kind of be patient, uh, which, you know, a year is a long time. I thought it would be three, six months, but when it kept being longer and longer, you know, um, it, it just kind of tested uh, the will that I had. So um, was very thankful that we were able to find this. So it came about because uh, one of the general partners through, of course, the Jake and Gino Networking Club, um, he, he saw that I was active in the community. I was posting on Facebook. I was, uh, sending out offers and, you know, it's, it's not really enough to just kind of do a lot of action in a silo. I think you have to do the action, but then you have to let other people know, Hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm looking for a partner who wants to be a part of that. And if you do it one or two times, no one's going to notice, but after you've done it 20 or 30 times, someone's going to say, Hey, this kid's still around. He's still working hard. 
I think that there's something that he can help me out with because everyone's that's doing deals. They're busy. They all don't have enough time. They would love to give this off to somebody that they trust. So, and that's what the case was with this deal. Um, the main general partner, he has a lot of money and he has a lot of units and a lot of other deals. And he says, I, I really don't have time for this one deal. It's kind of a little too small, but it's a good deal. So I see the attractive. I like your energy. I have faith in you. I'll let you head it up and just kind of do all of the work. I'm here if you need me, give me a call, ask me questions, you'll never bug me, but you do all the legwork. If you think something's the right thing to do, just do it, I trust you. Um, and and I mean, that's that's really probably the only reason that I'm in this deal is because somebody else with better connections just saw me and, and decided to bring me into it. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of how these next deals that I'm working on are going is because other people in the community uh, see the value that I'm, I'm bringing really is just like a bunch of energy and say, Hey, what do you need? I'll, I'll do it. Um, and they're giving me tasks to do and I'm doing them. And, uh, and, you know, kind of from there, we'll, I'll learn a little bit more about how these systems work and be able to get a few of my own deals. But, you know, at the start, the first few just kind of come from someone else taking some favor on you and getting lucky, but, but you got to put the effort in to show people that, that you know what you're doing. Few questions there. So first one, when you mentioned putting it out there, do you mean like posting on social media, like on a regular consistent basis, just to give yourself more publicity and let the world know that, you know, you're in real estate, you need, uh, not need, but you um, are looking for partners. Um, so like more of publicizing uh, your involvement and interest in, in real estate. Is that correct? Yeah. I once a month, some of them are once a week. I would rather just to show face and let them know that, hey, I'm still here, I'm looking for this. Um, I like to make phone calls to brokers, to other syndicators once a month just to say hi, catch up on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but then, yeah, the thing that was most effective because it had the widest reach was uh, posting on the Facebook groups and saying, honestly, hey, here's what I did this week. Hey, I've got this opportunity on this deal. I have some questions, I've already underwritten it. Who wants to give me some feedback and just trying to have some interaction so people can say that you know i'm not just asking for a handout i'm saying i'm putting in the work who wants to you know tell me what's right or wrong right i do find that real estate community super helpful um mm -hmm. whenever i like posted the question on the bigger pockets forum and like within an hour I got like 10 comments and like feedback and guidance and i was like wow this is great everyone is so involved and very helpful Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but as a second follow-up question, so the 32 unit, um, would you suggest for new syndicators to kind of try the route of smaller scale deals? I know for a few, like there's different approaches, right? To syndication deals, but sometimes you will kind of rely on other uh, syndicators track record for like, you know, larger, like 200, 300 unit uh, apartment complexes, but it seems like you, um, you know, through networking, we're able to get in a deal smaller, 32 unit, but you are heavily involved. So is that a strategy you would recommend to um, new syndicators as well? You know, I think it can go both ways. Um, I think the smaller deals, you know, like less than 70 units um, are good because you only need a couple people on the deal and you can have a larger piece of the pie and a lot more action, and a lot more involvement. Mm -hmm. um, and generally those are mom and pop deals. So they tend to have better rates of return. You can have more room for error. If there's a problem, you can kind of quickly correct it, um, you know, and, and the raises are smaller. So, you know, you can get uh, a couple of friends together and, and do the funding. So I think that's one way to go. I like it just because, you know, I'm a numbers guy and percent wise, that's a better percentage. So it, it's attractive to me. Um, and it, there's a better chance that you can call an owner as a mom and pop and they'll agree to sell it to you off market or something like that. But mm -hmm. I do think just going straight into the bigger route is a, a, a just as viable a way to go. But the way to do that is you have to find some other syndicator that's already doing those big deals and join their team. Um, and some of them are a little guarded in that they are doing a lot of business and they don't really want to take the time to train some newbie. Um, so you really have to find a way to provide good value to them in a way that they're not feeling like they have to, you know, hold your hand and educate you. And, you know, if they're in their minds, they're probably saying, Hey, I can hire an assistant for 50, 60 grand a year to do the role that you're trying to do. Why would I, you know, bring you on as a general partner or even an intern and have to teach you all this stuff when you're just going to take the knowledge from me and leave and do your own thing. So. I, I think there's merit in both, but it just comes down to who's your mentor, what are they doing right now, and what, you know where do you eventually want to be? If you eventually want to be doing bigger deals, 
maybe we just kind of go that way. For me, I'd be happy just, you know, doing tons of, you know, 30 and 50 unit deals. Right. And then to go into more details on your exact role. So did you help uh, capital raise? I, you mentioned underwriting. Um, you're a numbers guy, so I presume that you underwrote the deal. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about your role? How interactive was it? Did you do the due diligence? Did you walk every unit? Um, I I love like looking, touching, feeling the real estate and going to open houses. So like I presume that was my favorite step. But, like what was your favorite step in the process? Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I am a under, numbers guy. Uh, underwriting is, you know, what's exciting to me. I mean, you know, you're sitting in front of a desk, so it, you know, it is what it is. But at the same time, like, if someone were to say, "Hey, I think there's a good deal," I get excited to plug it in and see where the numbers fall out and be like, "Yeah, this can work." Um, so, so that was the part that I was in is doing the initial underwrite. Uh, as soon as you know, I saw that it could be a deal. I think it was like Sunday you know, Monday morning, like without even, you know, the broker telling us any off, I said, Hey, let me just go drive over there. Cause it was like an hour from my house. I said, I'll drive over there. Um, just kind of drove the outside. And I said, yeah, this confirms all the stuff that I had assumed in the uh, underwriting. You know, I think this is a good deal. Let's do it. Um, you know, and, and the way that it was set up, the main partner wanted me to take the lead. So I, I pretty much did everything. And he was just there for questions. So I negotiated with the wholesaler to get the deal under contract, um, you know, get the terms all set out there. Um, I did all of the due diligence in the sense that, you know, I talked to the insurance, the banks, um, the attorneys, um, you know, we had another guy do the actual inspection with an inspector because he was more on the renovation side as one of the partners. Um, but, you know, just kind of gave him the go ahead to do that. Um, I put the investor deck together. I, you know, I called the one guy who I thought was going to be interested in doing the raise as a silent partner. And luckily he said yes. And he just did the whole thing. Um, so I pretty much did every part of that. But having the mentor to call and bounce ideas off of was extremely helpful. Because without that, I'm, I'm sure I would have made a few more mistakes. That's amazing. You have uh, a mentor on speed dial, but then you have the freedom to kind of make mistakes. But then having like a little safety net just in case you have questions or you know, needed a second person's opinion. Um, well, and the interesting thing is in the negotiations, uh, they wanted a lot of partners money. They wanted like $40,000 of partners money immediately, not refundable. And like, you know, that was a lot of money. I've never put that much hard earned money in any deal, much less non-refundable, like, you know, and, and so it's kind of scared me, but the, the main general partner said, hey, look, you don't have to worry because the price that we're buying at is a good price. And I said, oh, what if, you know, some problems that come up that are unexpected and he has like what kind of problems are going to come up he's like we're buying it at such a price and we're getting such good financing terms with like the bridge debt financing that like if there's a problem we have a budget to fix it so like i'm not scared to put hard house money up if we do find some huge problems unforeseen you know oh well but like it's you know it's just kind of part of how real estate goes and at this point this is a good enough deal it's worth it let's do it and that that really kind of eased my mind in the sense that you know single family residences are a little different if you have a big problem it can kill a single family deal but if you have a huge problem with a multi-family deal and you have a good enough capitalization budget you can fix a lot of problems but i think if you go in and you know the class of property that you're buying you know if you're buying something super old you just know what you're getting into you need a huge capex budget uh, but if you're well capitalized you can kind of withstand a lot of a lot of problems and and you kind of have to be well capitalized while you're learning you can you know trim the budget down you can be a little more aggressive and a little more competitive sorry froze there okay sorry <laughs> back back on um i guess as a next question you close on this deal so congratulations um what is the next yeah, milestone uh so we are you know in the middle right now of transitioning with the property manager to get the business plan going um we're having contractors, uh, you know, they, they've got everything ready. We're basically buying the materials right now so they can get started doing the renovations. We're thinking it'll probably take about two or three months to get all of the exterior and then a couple of the interior units done. And then we'll start slowly turning the units as the leases come up. So, so that's kind of the business plan on that one. Um, it'll be probably one or two months of heavy, intensive work, just getting everything transitioned. But then from there, you know, hopefully calls once a week just to make sure everything's on track. Um, and even while that's going on, I still have people uh, sending me deals that I need to underwrite and that we send offers on. I, I did a tour this morning with something in Waco and, um, you know, the, the machine just doesn't stop because, you know, I'm, I'm ready for that next deal. So 
uh, yeah, it's just kind of keeping keeping doing everything I've been doing, and then also adding adding this one to my plate. Just make sure it stays on track. It's great that you quit your job because it seems like you're super busy with underwriting and then managing the asset. It it has, yeah. I I I think about it because I did lose a lot of income by not doing this, but at the same time, there's no way I could be doing what I'm doing now when I have a job. So it, it was pretty necessary. But uh, you know, yeah, it's it's helpful now to be able to have that. Out of curiosity, what is the strategy? Um, do you have a strategy of acquiring new deals? Will you be building out your team um, so you can kind of was it um, delegate underwriting to a new team member while you focus on asset management? Like, what is your overall strategy? Yeah, so I, uh, the next step, I'd like to focus on the capital raising side. Uh, I've, I'm, you know, I've got some VAs that I'm going to interview that can help with online marketing and growing the brand awareness. Um, not in a huge way, but just kind of something subtly, slowly, so that it gets my name out there. So the next time I do need to raise money, uh, it goes a little easier. Um, so that's the next immediate step that I want to do. Um, on top of that, it's going to be continuing. I've got a couple of other syndicators that are doing 100 to 200 unit deals. And I'm going to continue to build value and underwrite for them and um, you know, let them know that I'm good to capital raise a small amount for them, uh, probably up to 500000 and you know, say that, hey, I can contribute this to your next deal. Let me know when it's ready. Um, so those are kind of the two main ways that I'm going to do it. And then once I have a good steady rhythm with that and I get a little bit of free time, I'm going to um, you know, start doing some direct to seller uh cold calls or text message campaigns not myself but you know you get a system in place where one of these automated processes just does it for you and then you kind of manage it and eventually you hire it out to another va so that's kind of the next three steps of, of what's in the pipeline when you mentioned like direct to seller this is more of like larger scale units calling the owner directly to like have an offer ready for them right like hey uh, let me you know everything about selling it i want to buy it for this amount of money that kind of Right. Up. Yeah. So there's there's kind of two campaigns that we're going to run at the same time. Um, we've got a list from CoStar of about 3,000 owners uh, in Texas that, you know, are like less than 100 units um, that haven't traded in the last 10 years. And those are kind of the, the mom and pop owners that we're targeting because, you know, if it hasn't sold in 10 years, it's likely to sell. Um, and 3,000 is enough of a number where it's like, you know, all over Texas, but yet, you know, it, it'll it'll get us hopefully some leads, but not be too overwhelming. So, so we're going to probably do like you know 100 text messages a day through this program, where it just sends out the bulk texts. We see what comes back, and we kind of respond. To, you know, most of them are going to be bad numbers or something. So we we kind of respond to that as it goes. So we'll start off with text messages, and then you know maybe the next month we'll do a ringless voicemail, and then the month after we'll go back to a text message. Um, you know, of course, you kind of filter down the list to the few people who are responsive are, are willing to sell and then you know you meet them you tour their property maybe you take them out to dinner and i'm sure you know from what i've heard the stories no one's ready to sell at the right price when you meet them at the first time but after six months of kind of courting them and checking in on them <laughs> might be a little more motivated and that then you might have a deal i've heard the process is a lot like dating like you know if you go up to someone that you really <laughs> like perhaps not the first second time but if you're really persistent you will you know eventually they will uh give you a chance and um very similar to homeowners right yeah yeah with with homeowners i think you can get kind of lucky with someone that's in foreclosure very motivated they might just say hey look here you go but with multifamily properties you know most of the time these are income producing people that kind of know what you know, knows that their property's hot no one really needs to sell for a bad price um, so it is a lot more of like dating and courting, like you said, and everyone's got an idea of their price should be up here. And even if they do want to sell, well, why do they want to sell with you? So, uh, yeah, it, it takes quite a few months to build that rapport and, and the people that kind of come in strong and say right off the bat, Hey, I want to buy your property. They get, they get pushed to the side, but the people that come in and try to build the relationship are the ones who end up getting the deal. Building the trust, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it takes longer than coming out yeah. strong and forceful. Mm -hmm. Uh, my last two questions would be, what is your advice to your younger self, maybe perhaps a decade younger, um, of, you know, what kind of advice would you give your, yourself 10 years ago? And then, you know, how, I guess, for many uh, pertaining to real estate, for anyone who wants to get started, who's already in real estate, but needs that extra nudge, what would you tell them? So I would say, you know, from houses and learning how that would work before I got into apartments and 
you know, there's, there's, you know, kids that are like in their twenties, like, you know, 20 or 21 right now that are already doing apartments. So I wish I had just dreamed, dreamed bigger when I was younger. Uh, and then the second thing would be, you know, just kind of find the mentors that are already doing what you need to do and, you know, get in with them and, you know, start providing value to them somehow. Um, and then the third thing I would say is, you know, spend your money on paying for education, um, paying for mentorship programs, um, paying to join networking groups, paying for that kind of direct access is going to be a lot better than, um, you know, tr you know, trying to invest and do your deal on your own. Um, because I think that is valuable. I think you should save some money so that you can invest it. Um, but, you know, using that money to, you know, build a relationship where you have access to way more information and mentorships and partnerships is going to help you grow so much faster than just trying to do it on your own. That's very helpful advice. I'm always very, I guess, um, the membership cost for a lot of the uh, masterminds very expensive, but the fact that, you know, you're advocating spending that uh, money on education to provide value for yourself and build out your network is very valuable. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Well, and you know, that's, that's kind of what mine is too, because some of these like are $20,000 to join and that's a huge amount. And, you know, in my head, my thought was, well, what if I just found a deal and I put that 20,000 into it, you know, like that, that seems like a smarter way to go. But then the way that it was kind of uh, portrayed to me is that, you know, you could do that. Number one, are you going to find the best deal on your own or partnering with someone? And then number two is, you know, even if you find the right deal, are you going to make a mistake that'll cost you more than $20,000? And on a $2 million building, $20,000 mistake is pretty easy to do. There's plenty of things that could cost you that much money. Um, so just kind of having the peace of mind, the opportunities and the mentors to take you through that is is going to be more valuable. And I've already gotten access to deals that are going to make me much more money than that initial 20000 cost. Right. And accelerate your learning at the same time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I guess to close off our interview, any parting thoughts, anything else you want to share with the audience? You have a very calming aura to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with real estate closing deals, you get lots of, um, I don't want to say like competitiveness, but very mm -hmm. calm. Um, that's some patience, something I'm trying to learn, you know, whether it's real estate <laughs> or worth the work to have more patience in life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, you know, yeah, just kind of general advice in, uh, in life. Um, you know, I think anyone that's listening to this podcast probably already has like 99% of general life advice, you know, like don't, you know, spend more than you're making. Um, kind of look into the future and, and plan for the next steps. Um, dream bigger, you know, kind of all those things are there. But but I would say, you know, out, outside of all the stuff that we've talked so far is, you know, uh, I, I'd say it's, it's probably also easy to burn yourself out. Um, mm. When I was in mortgage, it, I was constantly answering the phones, constantly feeling like I had to go above and beyond, which was great. It, it kind of built my career. It gave me more clients, um, but it never stopped, you know? So, so there is a point when you do get burnt out. And even right now, as we're taking over this building, I can feel the temptation to just work extra long, just to like try to go faster. And um, I think patience in that sense is, is extremely important and also kind of setting mental boundaries so that you can say, I work so many hours a week or at a certain time of day I'm done, or Hey, if your brain just doesn't work, feel like don't force it, you know, go for a walk, take a nap, you know, come back to it with a fresh set of eyes and you're going to be much more receptive to growing than if you try to force through something and burn yourself out. So, you know, be kind to yourself, give yourself breaks, kind of know your limits and, um, you know, you're, you're going to grow better when you're happier. Um, so just never force it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, why don't you leave with the, uh, leave the audience, like your hobbies, what do you do when you're not, you know, working? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a, well, the whole, you know, like you said, my why is for freedom. So what's the point of working so hard if I can't enjoy life along the way? So um, I just got back from a snowboarding trip in Aspen with a couple of friends. Uh, so I love, you know, kind of getting out there, um, any kind of physical activity. So uh, I joined some sand volleyball teams. So I like to do that in the evenings. Um, you know, we've got beautiful Lake Travis out over here. Now that it's getting a little warmer, I'll probably pop over there to the lake on a boat or spend some time in the uh, water a little bit. Um, outside of that, you know, I, I love, you know, having a nice mixed drink or a cocktail, uh, you know, on a good Friday, yeah, night with friends, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think I'll ever get too far away from that. So yeah, between those things and, and real estate, I'm, I'm a pretty happy guy. Awesome. We, uh, definitely need drinks on Fridays, <laughs> including myself. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much for your time and all the insight you share with us. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. The last time I stopped the recording, I pressed uh, end the call. So give me one second. <laughs>